Good, uh, good morning. My uh, apologies for the uh, technical uh, difficulties. Um, I am, uh, um, uh, um, well, I need to report that last night we had a, f a flood in the uh, Kennedy Institute. Uh, there was yesterday a fire in the basement here, which has caused the electrical difficulties. And as uh, Father uh, Miles Sheehan just suggested to me, we will probably be serving locusts for lunch. <laughs> um, um, uh, apologies to all of you who are present here. Um, apologies to those who are waiting to join us, have been waiting patiently to join us on uh, Zoom. Uh, welcome to uh, Georgetown, which probably needs to do a little more work on delayed uh, uh, deferred maintenance. Um, but, uh, but welcome to our 75th uh, um, anniversary of the uh, uh, Nuremberg Medical Trial uh, Symposium. Um, the events that we're going to talk about uh, today um, are horrific, um, but um, I would like us to keep um, in mind that one of the purposes of this conference um, is to try to concentrate as best we can on how we can learn um, from these events, um, things that are relevant uh, to the practice of medicine and ethics in general um, uh, today. Um, I have to um, express thanks um, to those who have helped to support this, uh, to Centile here on the campus, to the Center for Medicine After the Holocaust uh, from uh, Houston, um, and the Isaac Frank, uh, Edmund Pellegrino, and Andre Helliger's lectureships, which we've all combined um, to, from the Kennedy Institute to, to um, uh, uh, fund this uh, today. A few day, uh, details for those of you who are here in person. Again, I apologize for those who are um, joining us online. Um, the restrooms. Um, um, if you want to find them, you go out the doors at the back of the room, turn right, go down the uh, hallway, uh, um, and then at the um, main hallway, uh, turn uh, right again, and go make a slight right across the room, um, and, uh, and follow the breadcrumbs to get back. <laughs> Um, there will be, um, uh, again, I'll remind you, a 30-minute break from 10.30 uh, to 11. Um, that uh, applies to those who are joining us on Zoom as well as to those who are live uh, here. Uh, lunch will be from 1 to 2.30. For those who are here in person, those um, uh, we will have breakout uh, sessions. Those will not be live uh, streams. So those who are um, uh, joining us on Zoom will have to uh, rejoin us at 2.30. Um, but lunch from 1 to 2.30. Um, your badges should uh, show you an S or a W for your lunch assignment. Um, uh, if you uh, uh, have forgotten your badge or lose it, go to the registration table. Uh, box lunches will be available to uh, pick up. For those who have re requested kosher meals, they'll be uh, marked. Um, uh, please don't uh, take those meals uh, if you don't need a kosher meal. Um, uh, those who are attending uh, Rabbi Steinberg's uh, lunchtime session, that'll be in the Herman room. Uh, uh, and for Professor Weindling, that'll be in the uh, social room. Um, and we'll uh, end um, uh, um, at, uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, with for those who are um, uh, here in person, the uh, potential to visit our, uh, our library. Um, the um, moderator for this morning's uh, session and uh, the uh, uh, is uh, Professor Dr. Father Miles Sheehan. Um, he is the director of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics, the co-sponsor of this program, um, the Lawler uh, professor, um, and he is a Jesuit priest, a physician, um, a geriatrician, um, former dean of students at Loyola Stritch. We're uh, really privileged uh, to have him here, and uh, please come, uh, Miles, to the podium and uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you. I said we'd have locusts at lunch. I must say, when I was a little boy reading Exodus, I liked the plague of frogs the best. I just thought that would be so cool. But uh, <laughs> as we begin our morning's presentation, I am happy to introduce um, Dr. Sheldon Rubenfeld. He's a clinical professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as the executive director for the Center for Medicine After the Holocaust. And his topic this morning will be medicine during the Third Reich. Sheldon. Thank you very much. As it turns out, we should have power restored momentarily so that the people in the room here will be able to uh, see what's being projected over Zoom. 
So it's a pleasure to be here. It's an important conference, and I'm delighted to open this part of, this, of the conference and speak to you about medicine during the Third Reich, give you an overview of what happened, and talk about some of the implications for contemporary medicine. I'd like to begin and just talk about the medical ethos, which is an important concept. The ethos, is, an ethos in general, is the distinguishing character, sentiment, moral nature, or guiding beliefs of a person, group, or institution. In particular, the medical ethos is determined by three competing factors. One is medicine itself. How does the medical profession present itself? What are its goals, its ideals, its principles? Then you have to compete with the culture or society, which has its own ideas about what medicine should be or do for society. And finally, you have politicians, the government passes rules and regulations that govern, influence, and can dramatically change how medicine is practiced. And now we actually, uh, for those of you on Zoom who don't know this, we actually now have a projector here in our room. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the people in the room. <laughs> I'll take a quick history tour. There's been a conflict of visions about medicine pretty much forever. The essential conflict can be defined by a view from two different mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Olympus. For Mount Sinai, you have a view that the holy is beautiful. So for example, life is of supreme, if not infinite, value. And you have the opposite view from Mount Olympus, where it is the beautiful that is considered holy. So for the Greeks, and you can think of the magnificent Michelangelo statue of the David, beauty is essential. And that which is not beautiful should not necessarily exist. So the Greeks practice infanticide, suicide, euthanasia. You can think about the opening of the Oedipus Rex where Oedipus is left out in a rock uh, to die by his parents. So this is a conflict that's been going on forever between two conflicting visions of how the world should be, particularly the medical world. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes an oddball named Hippocrates. And he was opposed to many of the things, many of the practices that were going on in ancient Greece at that time. And in particular, he made a separation between killing and death and positioned the medical profession at those who would profess healing and saving lives no longer participating in any kind of killing whatsoever. That was a very important statement. And we, wouldn't, we don't know for sure whether it's Hippocrates who wrote his oath. He left a large corpus of information, but the author, uh, the, we don't know if he's actually the author of the Hippocratic Oath. Most people, including medical professionals, have never really read the original Hippocratic Oath. The reason we know about it, it's been transmitted over the millennia by Christianity, essentially. Here you have a copy of the oath in the shape of a cross. I've listed next to that the eight essential principles that are in the oath, and most of them are universal or had been universal except for the appreciation of Greek deities. Needless to say, Christianity was not in favor of that. But the other principles are pretty universal. One in particular I'd highlight is the oath prescribed, prescribed euthanasia. Fast forward now a few millennia to the founding of the United States. The United States was most successful of any country I can think of to incorporating the views of Mount Olympus and Mount Sinai. It's the only Judeo-Christian country literally in the world. Michael Novak, a Christian uh, Catholic theologian, wrote a book called On Two Wings, describing how the United States managed to incorporate the Hebrew Bible and the Enlightenment into its founding. In fact, here you have the first two designs of the official seal of the United States, which shows in the design by Benjamin Franklin on your left, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, and the next one, designed by Thomas Jefferson, shows the Israelites wandering in the desert. This obviously did not become the official seal of the United States, but they were part of the committee to design the seal of the United States, and this was their creation by Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Fast forward another century, 
after, after Charles Darwin came up with his theory of evolution, his cousin Francis Galton came up with the idea of eugenics. Eugenics is a science, and this is how, uh, how he defined it, Francis Galton, is a science which deals with all influences that improve the inborn qualities of a race, also with those that develop them to the utmost advantage. And this is very reminiscent of what was going on in ancient Greece at the time of Hippocrates. Now, as a practical matter, eugenics was a very popular science or pseudoscience from the late 1800s until the middle of the 20th century. And here we have a cartoon, a four-panel cartoon, which pretty much summarizes what positive and negative eugenics are. You see a man looks suspiciously like Hitler, who's molding the new uh, superhuman that he hoped to create. That's positive eugenics. You encourage the people you consider to be superior to procreate, and you provide them with all sorts of support, including medical support. At the same time, you have someone looking on who suspiciously looks Jewish, who is there in the first few panels and then disappears. This would be negative eugenics. You don't provide medical care for people you consider inferior, and you definitely do not let them reproduce, and perhaps we even eliminate them. So if you look at posters during the Third Reich about eugenics, which was very popular in Germany at the time, you see a poster like this where a, a German is supporting two people with physical deformities and at great expense. And this was one of the driving rationales for the entire Nazi program that could be construed as a very large public health measure that went astray. It's just a different way of looking at the entire Holocaust. Indeed, Adolf, uh, Adolf Hitler fashioned himself as the doctor to the German Vogue. And what he did, which was so critical to understand, is he transformed the Hippocratic Oath, which is essentially recommendations for how to behave as a doctor toward a patient. And what he did, he substituted the state, the German state for the doctor, and the German nation's body for the patient. So if you're treating a population instead of an individual, certain members who can presumably transmit inferior traits need to be eliminated. And that's what the doctor to the German people did. Well, I'm sorry I can't hear any sound here. Um, this is actually a video uh, which shows, talks about Auschwitz. And in there, we have a, um, a non-Jewish physician who was a, um, a physician in a concentration camp. And she was asked, yeah, come on, if you can fix this, that'll be good, because I have another video to show later on. Uh, she was actually a doctor in a concentration camp. Oh, good idea. So she, was, she asked the physicians, other physicians who, who, who were performing these dastardly acts, how they could violate the Hippocratic House. And they would say things like, the Jew was like an infected appendix on the German body and needs to be eliminated. So we are, in fact, fulfilling the Hippocratic Oath. This, needless to say, is very problematic when you're dealing with bioethics as it was, when you have people not only violating the Hippocratic Oath, but assuming the high moral ground based upon their actions. Auschwitz-Birkenau was not just the Nazis' biggest extermination camp. It was also the source of slave labor for many of Germany's largest industries who built factories nearby. In the huge new plants, the average prisoner worker would last three to six months before dying of exhaustion, disease, or starvation. The labor force was controlled by SS doctors. They selected who was to work and who was to die. Anybody could have simply sorted out the 
relatively intact young adults from children, pregnant women, old people, all of whom were sent immediately to the gas chamber. But the Nazis wanted to give it a medical cast and to see it as done within the realm of medical thought and even medical justification. And that's why doctors are at the ramp at Auschwitz. Ella Lingens was an Austrian doctor who had been sent to Auschwitz in 1943 for sheltering Jews. One day she watched as the SS burned their victims' bodies. I asked the SS doctor next to me, how can you reconcile this with your Hippocratic Oath? And he answered, precisely because I have sworn the Hippocratic Oath, I'm cutting out a festering appendix. The Jews are the festering appendix in the body of Europe. And this is why they must be cut out. And that was how he had twisted the truth, according to his philosophy. This is sort of a summary slide of the entire Third Reich and how we wound up going from a theory of eugenics to the final solution. You begin with the theory of eugenics, which was popular at the time in Germany and elsewhere, as we'll discuss. And then you go ahead and you try to prevent transmission of inferior genes. And the first method they did was to sterilize people. And we're talking about large numbers. Approximately 400,000 German citizens were sterilized in the first six years of the Third Reich. They also passed Nuremberg laws, which prevented marriage and sexual relations between Aryans and non-Aryans. At a critical stage, they decided they were going to eliminate people whom they considered to have inferior genes. And they began euthanizing German children with disabilities. Now you have to think this through. If the Germans were willing to kill their own children, they would certainly have no qualms about killing those they con considered inferior who were not citizens or German. And that made a lot of people very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable. Children were killed with poison, starvation, exposure. Then after that, the Germans took on an adult euthanasia program, which was called the T4 program for a variety of reasons. And in this program, approximately 200,000 people were killed. The first 70,000 were killed in gas chambers. And this is a critical point. Gas chambers were designed by physicians to kill disabled German adults. The program was very successful from the German point of view. And indeed, they started taking people that were very problematic within concentration camps and bringing them to six euthanasia centers that were established in Germany and Austria, some of which were hospitals who had in the basement a gas chamber and a crematorium. Eventually, we get to the final solution by taking these very same gas chambers and making them much, much bigger and putting them in death camps like Auschwitz. I have the medical experiments in there because they are the focus of the Nuremberg medical trial. But if you look at the numbers, only around 30,000 individuals were involved in the medical experiments, which is bad enough. But compared to everything else that was going on at the time, it's a relatively small number. And most of the world is focused on what happened at the Nuremberg Medical Trial and the Nuremberg Code, rather than all the other medical atrocities that were committed during that time. This is one of the concentrate, this is one of the gas chambers in a psychiatric hospital that was one of the six euthanasia centers. Carl Brandt, who was a physician, head of the euthanasia program, said at the time, the needle belongs in the hands of the physician. In other words, physicians should be carrying out this euthanasia for the state, and they were inclined to do so. They were not manipulated to do so. They were enthusiastic about it. Eugenics had been advocated by the medical profession for 30 years before Hitler came on the scene. So as it says, doctors gave the orders. The physicians were pioneers. They were not pawns of the fascist state. If you go back to my original concept of the medical ethos, and the balancing of three conflicting factions. During the Third Reich, 
medicine was very strong. Medicine was very strong long before Hitler came on the scene. Germany had the best medicine in the world because they developed scientific medicine. People came from all over the world to study in Germany. Osler went there, others went there. It was very good medicine. They won most of the Nobel Prizes in physiology and medicine. And obviously at that time, the government was very strong. A fascist state obviously has a great deal of control over everything that goes on within the state. And the culture had to go along. They really did not have a choice. So this was what was going on in terms of the medical ethos at the time during the Third Reich. Eventually it came to an end. The Allies won the war. They held a trial of the uh, major war criminals in Nuremberg. I think 23 or 24 people were put on trial. A dock was built for those 23 or 24 major war criminals. And this trial was conducted by the four allies. But after that, there were 12 subsequent trials that were, conduct that were conducted by the United States. And the first of those was the Nuremberg Medical Trial, which took place, as you can see, from late 1946 into 1947 when the Nuremberg Code was issued. And this is the 75th anniversary of that trial in this code. The trial itself was very problematic. Americans didn't know whether to prosecute many of these people or to procure them. And they did procure a fair number of them. Operation Paperclip alone brought about 1,600 scientists to the United States. Perhaps the most famous was Werner von Braun, the father of American sci rocket science, who was also the father of German rocket science. More uh, relevant to our talk today is a doctor you may never have heard of, Dr. Hubertus Strughold who was the father of American space medicine. Prior to that, he was the father of German space medicine. And he was a very big man on campus at NASA, which is near Houston, until his previous work came to light. And the American government put him on trial three different times without ever convicting him. There was a lot of effort to cover up what the medical profession did in Germany. First and foremost, by the medical profession in Germany itself. And secondly, America was not that interested in prosecuting many of these war criminals because they wanted to procure them. The Russians wanted them badly, and so did we. So there's a constant tension. In fact, four of the defendants in the Nuremberg medical trial at one time or another prior to being put on trial were working for the United States military. So a lot of myths were developed to kind of make it seem as if there wasn't much involvement of the medical profession. And this is just a statement about how good you, we humans are at moral myth making. Let me give you some examples of myths about the medical profession in Germany. That these doctors were very few in number, that they were incompetent, they were coerced, they were sadistic, they were mad, and they were unethical. You may or may not know that roughly half of all the doctors in Germany joined the Nazi party, a much higher percentage than any other profession by far in Germany. They were highly represented in the SS. They were not incompetent. They were among the best doctors in the world. They were not coerced. They went along willingly, although they were induced. There were many inducements provided, as you'll hear later on, to physicians to go along with the Nazi program. Some of them, no doubt, were sadistic, but most of them were not. And they were hardly mad as a group, although, of course, some of them were. And we'll get to the ethics piece in a moment, and you'll hear more about that as the day goes on. To give you an example, the design and the implementation of eugenics, euthanasia, and all the rest came out of German academic medicine. This is the dean of the University of Vienna, Dean Pernkoff, University of Me Vienna Medical School, and you see he's being saluted by his faculty. That, that was one of the major problems that was the, the academics that were promoting much of this work. And the academics were in themselves induced to do some of this work because if you can eliminate your Jewish chief of staff, he could be replaced by an Aryan chief of staff. So they had a lot of incentive to go along with the program, and they did. And they were in favor before Hitler came along. I, another myth is that there was really only one crazy doctor involved in all of this, and that was uh, Joseph Mengele. 
By the way, I put Michael DeBakey in there, who's kind of an icon in Houston. Uh, the late Michael DeBakey actually went to Germany in the 1930s to study. He may have studied when Joseph Mengele was studying in Germany as well. While you may know the name of Joseph Mengele, this other man, Ernfried Burl, most people know nothing about this man. Mengele is called the Angel of Death. Let me tell you who you see goes right and left on the ramps at Auschwitz, and he experimented on maybe 1,500 twins. He's the angel of death. Let me tell you about Ermfried Eberl. Ermfried Eberl headed two of the six euthanasia centers, each one of which was responsible for killing about 10,000 people. He then went on to become the commandant at Treblinka, where he killed 250,000 people, where he was fired before uh, because he was not disposing of the bodies quickly enough. So if you call Mengele the angel of death, what do you call a guy you never heard of named Ernfried A. Burl, who did much, much worse than Mengele? This is a translation of a book by Rudolf Rahm, a book that was uh, read, required reading in a required ethics course, which all German medical students had to take during the Third Reich. And you'll be hearing more about this book later on, but the point is the Nazis had their own medical ethics when no one else in the world was really concerned to this degree about medical ethics. So the, their ethics, of course, were very distasteful, but they did have ethics. A second important myth relevant to us is that neither liberal democracies nor we, physicians as individuals, are capable of doing such evil. This is a book by Madison Grant, which was written in 1916. He was a conservationist, a lawyer, friend of presidents. Uh, a corporal in the army got a hold of his book, wrote him a fan letter, and that corporal, of course, was Adolf Hitler, wrote Madison Grant a fan letter saying, this book is my Bible. This is a poster advising people to choose their mate carefully before marrying because you could get bad genes into your family and your gene pool, and this is in German, it's a copy from uh, an article in Louisiana. German was added to it. And I mention that because the world's leader in eugenics was the United States by far. In fact, Germans claimed, and I think it's accurate to say so, they were simply trying to catch up with the United States. The United States, being a republic, moves much more slowly so while many of the things that were proposed in Germany had already been proposed in the United States, they couldn't be implemented because of our Republican and Federalist nature. Whereas in Germany, in a very few years, they were able to accomplish everything eugenists had been proposing for 30 years. So one might wonder, where was the outcry from Americans saying, this is terrible what the Germans were doing? Well, there were many eugenicists in the United States. I've listed some famous people you may have known, you may know about, uh, who were ardent eugenicists, presidents, presidents of universities, and so on. And this was one of the reasons there was no outcry against eugenics in Germany. In fact, some of these people, uh, uh, philanthropists in particular, provide funds to do eugenic research in Germany. Of course, once the war started, everything changed. After the war, eugenics became a very bad word. The sterilization program in Germany was modeled after the United States sterilization program, specifically the model sterilization law of Virginia, which came to the Supreme Court for a test in 1927, an infamous case called Buck versus Bell, which ended with an eight to one decision saying uh, involuntary compulsory sterilization is constitutional. And it, that particular decision ended with of an infamous statement saying three generations of imbeciles is enough. By the way, in the United States, there were roughly 60,000 involuntary uh, sterilizations. The first one was in 1907 in the state of Indiana, the first one in the world, legal involuntary compulsory sterilization. The last of the 60,000 was in the state of Oregon in 1981. In 1924, an Immigration Act was passed in the United States, which was directed at Asians to keep all of them out and to keep most Europeans out, except particularly those from Eastern Asia, which, uh, excuse me, Eastern Europe, which meant Jews, and from Southern Europe, which meant 
specifically Italian Catholics. Hitler admired what we were doing in the United States. He wrote about it in his book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. You can see what he wrote here, how, how much he admired what we were doing in the United States regarding immigration. One of the reasons the United States could not, even if it wanted to, which it did not, take in Jews wanting to escape from Europe was because of this 1924 immigration law. The Nuremberg Laws about marriage were modeled after American Jim Crow laws, which were prevalent in the United States at that time, as described in this book, Hitler's American Model. So indeed, I think liberal democracies are capable of such things, but fortunately our democracy, our federalism, prevents us from charging downhill as rapidly as the Germans did. Indeed, I would contend, though, that things have changed quite a bit since that time. And if I look at the status of the medical ethics today, I would say that society or culture is very, very strong in the United States and very influential in the practice of medicine. And the government gets strong with each passing decade influencing what happens in medicine. And that medicine itself is a bit adrift. It's not really professing clear goals, statements, ethics. And this is the status of medicine as I see it today. I'll give you an example, for example for about the culture. This is a look at films that are about assisted suicide or euthanasia, going back quite a long time. And almost every one of them, except the one that I've highlighted in blue, is in favor of assisted suicide or euthanasia. Every one of them. And six of them have actually won Academy Awards. So that the culture has been promoting, for example, assisted suicide and euthanasia for a long, long time. In fact, now in the United States, we have 10 jurisdictions that permit assisted suicide. In Europe and Canada, euthanasia is also permitted in some states. So the culture has been profoundly influential. And it's a whole topic about how influential film is on the culture's thinking about medical profession, but at the end of the day, it's the medical profession that has to do the deed, as it were, of assisted suicide or euthanasia. And this is just one of many examples about how the culture influences medicine here in our country. Medicine has become centralized over the last 100 years. Uh, Bismarck, German, originally promote, uh, promoted national health insurance in the, 19, in the 1880s. It was very popular in Europe, Japan, and elsewhere. The United States did not pick up on it. In 1912, when Theodore Roosevelt ran on the Progressive Party platform, he proposed national health insurance, but it did not happen. In 1965, of course, we did get national health insurance for the elderly, Medicare and Medicaid. And through the decades, we have more and more people eligible for government support of medical care most recently Obamacare, which not only centralized medical care, but also corporatized it and changed the dynamic in medicine. So the government has been very influential in regulating and defining what medicine's ethos will be. Our education system in medicine is modeled after the German scientific medical education system. Abraham Flexner was sent by Carnegie in 1910 to Europe to study their medical system, specifically Germany, to change the medical system in Canada, and medical education in Canada and the United States. And in fact, it was adopted over the next few decades. And that is the model that we use to this very day, the German scientific model. And unfortunately, the German scientific model does not favor study of history like we're talking about today or most of the humanities, which leaves students somewhat ill-equipped to deal with conflicting visions of culture, medicine, and politics. Also in the United States, we've rejected the Judeo-Christian heritage regarding medicine and the Hippocratic tradition regarding medicine. Here you have a clear statement of that fact from a standard textbook of bioethics, which says, although major writings in ancient, medieval, and modern healthcare contain a rich 
storehouse of reflections on the relationship between the professional and the patient, these writings are inadequate for contemporary biomedical ethics. So think about it. systems that have been in existence for two to three thousand years are no longer up to the job of dealing with complicated medical ethics issues, which I think is a little bit arrogant to say something like that. If you've dealt with it for two, three thousand years, you probably could muster some ideas about how to deal with contemporary medical ethical issues. But in fact, the Hippocratic Oath has gone by the wayside. This is a study from 1993 which looked at the use of the Hippocratic Oath in medical schools. Already in 1993, there was only one school in 147 of the 150 medical schools in the United States and Canada that used the traditional Hippocratic Oath. There were a variety of other oaths taken in these 147 schools, but if you look at the content of the oath, you see very few of them reflect the original Hippocratic Oath. Something as basic as you should not have sex with your patients was not in these oaths. You should not kill people, not in most of these oaths. The Hippocratic Oath really went uh, by the wayside. We have another dangerous phenomenon going on, which is the doctor-patient relationship, individual patient care, is being pushed aside by concerns about different populations. And this shows up in terms of discussions of systemic racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, where you're dealing more with population ethics rather than medical ethics of the individual patient. And this is a dangerous trend which could ultimately turn out to be quite harmful. I go back to Hippocrates who really established medicine as a profession. A profession should profess something I think there's a fair amount of confusion in medicine about what medicine is professing. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. I was going to have you listen to uh, Dr. Pellegrino address this subject, but apparently we can't have sound in here. I'll tell you just, many of you know Dr. Pellegrino very well, but he's one of the few individuals that actually read all 3,000 pages of the transcript of the Nuremberg medical trial which is quite a feat in itself. And he went on to give a lecture in Houston in 2007 where he addressed the status of medical ethics, and Hippocratic Oath, and many other things, and decried the decline in professionalism, saying in essence that when a patient comes to a doctor, a patient, neither the patient nor the doctor know any longer what type of medical ethics will be available in that interchange. Medical ethics must adjust to the times. Fact of the matter is right now, the Hippocratic Oath has been entirely disemboweled, literally. Every one of its precepts has been questioned. And what will we have in its place we don't know yet. We have such people saying, no, no, physicians saying, well, it's negotiated between me and the patient. Whatever we agree to, that's what it should be. So you, the patient, I, the patient, do not know what we can expect in the way of ethics. We cannot expect a set of universally binding moral principles that apply to physicians as physicians. We are in that state. Saying, well, you're an ang angry old man worried about. No, I'm asking you to think about what, in fact, is happening. It concerns all of us. Medical ejects must adjust to the times. Acting on orders, read the newspapers. It was common practice everywhere in the world to do experiments without consent. Everybody's doing it. Why shouldn't we do it? All kinds of moral reasoning, they're all morally used arguments. Now, I'm coming to the close, I'll give a chance for my colleague to take the podium. Why the moral reasoning, I have to do this again by implication, they were not insane, as I said evil but not irrational. 
I don't buy the idea that the barrel was bad and that the apples were innocent. Bad apples make bad barrels. The identical presuppositions and justifications are commonplace. Wherever medical ethics is violated in torture, in warfare, say no more about that. There are ominous parallels in moral reasoning in non-totalitarian settings. When moral premises are immoral, moral decisions are immoral. So we have to learn how to do ethical reasoning and moral reasoning. The ethical end of medicine is healing and helping. By its very nature, that's what it's for. To subjugate that end to other purposes corrupts medical morality. And I will close with that thought and thank you all for listening. Um, you mentioned that population health is damaging to a certain extent the physician-patient relationship. From a policymaking standpoint, what policies do you think would enhance this physician-patient relationship and um, leave this relationship between those people instead of overemphasizing population health? Well, I think the focus in medical education needs to be on the healing and the care of the individual patient. Well, obviously, many societal pressures to look at it differently. When you turn out medical students as physicians, you want them to have some idea of what ethics the profession is professing. And I don't think they should be population ethics. They should not be looking at an individual as a member of a specific group or population. They should focus on that individual as an individual and provide them with the medical care that person needs as an individual. It's difficult to do. I think that's traditionally what's been done and what needs to be done now. Thank you. Um, can you say a little bit more about the different types of inducement that they used uh, versus the coercion of physicians? The question was about the different inducements provided to physicians in Germany. Is that correct? Yes. Well, there were financial inducements. Recall that this was all taking place during the Depression in the 1930s. So a lot of people were unemployed, particularly physicians. So all of a sudden you had the medical profession being at the center of the German political philosophy. Sterilizing 400,000 patients takes a lot of medical manpower. Every marriage required a certification by a physician that these people were genetically fit to marry. When you select people to sterilize them, you needed physicians to do the selection. When you selected people to be euthanized, you needed physicians to do the selecting. So there's a huge financial inducement for young physicians in particular to go along with what the regime was proposing. Plus, as I mentioned, they were already oriented that way. Secondly, academic physicians. If you were an academic physician and you wanted a promotion and there happened to be a Jewish colleague who was in your way, well, they weren't going to be very long in your way if you went along with a Nazi program. And there were many other inducements provided, but the, the physical and the, the financial and the academic were particularly important in getting large numbers of the academics and the non-academic physicians to go along. Also, you have just the appeal of power. Physicians had a tremendous amount of power in the Third Reich. So those are just some examples. And I think you'll be hearing some more about that as the day goes on. Um, in terms of 
um, contemporary like bioethical questions where the um, the like medicine of the Third Reich kind of has a relationship. Do you think that sterilization and kind of under the table on not particularly well documented sterilizations are still a problem? Because for instance, in Europe, in countries that are currently liberal democracies, uh, nations like the Czech Republic, uh, to a certain extent Hungary, are opening investigations into the sterilization of Romani communities, practices that continued well after the Second World War. In the United States and in Canada, um, like a tradition of like unrecorded and um, and like unapproved like sterilization of indigenous patients and of like immigrant communities has been cited as a reason why those um, groups um, are sometimes resistant to like consulting like physicians about illnesses more generally because of that fear of like bodily autonomy violations. Do you think that even though like Buck versus Bell even was never formally overturned? Um, do you think that sterilizations themselves are still a relevant problem in contemporary bioethics? And do you think that the kind of the legal regime we have right now is adequate to prevent them from happening? Well, that's quite a question. I'll try to give quite an answer. Uh, a lot of this history has been shoved under the rug. You know, it's not exactly our proudest moment. Let me put it in context. American medicine is wonderful. Uh, as a, as a formerly young, currently old person, I have to say I'm grateful to what American medicine has done for me and many of my colleagues. American medicine is just wonderful. There's no other way around that. Its accomplishments are tremendous. The other hand, no one's perfect, and American medicine has a history that has not been clearly elucidated. In fact, as you'll hear later, I'm sure more about the Nuremberg Medical Trial and the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code was not did not cause academic doctors to jump up and down and say, whoopee, this is just what we've been waiting for, just the opposite. Until then, they were able to experiment on people at will, basically, and they weren't excited about adopting the Nuremberg Code. It wasn't until later on, and this is reference to your question, when the Tuskegee syphilis experiments came to light and hit the newspapers, although it had never been kept secret, just no one paid attention to it, and that's really what caused a stir about uh, treatment of black patients in particular, and which led to an adoption of similar codes in the United States, and a, a rising from the, like a phoenix, the um, Nuremberg Code. Because until then, it really had been pretty much neglected. So I think your question is highly relevant, and that's one of the reasons we want to study this material. We want to learn from it. In fact, it's much easier to talk about this historical stuff because we can shed a lot of light as opposed to talking about contemporary issues where you're going to shed a lot of heat. We're not Nazis. There's no analogy between Germany and America, but we can learn a great deal from studying this history. Is this on? Hi. Um, I, my question is um, about the Tuskegee, post-Tuskegee um, exposure. Um, the American Public Health Service then went and did experiments on unsuspecting, I think, Guatemalans. Um, and that was well into, I think, the 1970s, if I remember correctly, before a journalist came out and exposed it. Um, the National Center for Bioethics is now at, at Tuskegee University. And every year, they have a conference bringing in some of the family members of the syphilis patients to do healing work. So my question is, how do we? work on continuing that healing process, um, not only with the Tuskegee um, families, but also with others that we've harmed, like in Guatemala and elsewhere. Yeah, there, there are a question relates to populations that are abused by the medical profession, and how do we now get them to trust the medical profession, which is a very difficult thing to do. But I think one way to do it is by acknowledging what actually happened. Um, if you don't acknowledge what happened, you're going to continue to be mistrusted. So I think that's the first step, and that's one of the goals of our teaching this material, simply acknowledging what happened. And from there, you can go on and say, we can't do this again. But if you don't know what you actually did, it's hard to avoid doing it again. So your question's right on point. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. This is, can you see me back here? I Hi there. Oh, yeah, there you there are. I am. Hi, Sarah Vitone. I'm uh, with the Pellegrino Center and also with the School of Nursing. 
I wonder um, if you might comment on the role or the interaction between the uh, German physicians and the nurses. I'm sure there were nurses that were all embraced into the state. Um, this was, you know, an important part of their work, the eugenics, the, the extermination, right? This, but there were also certainly physicians and nurses that probably disagreed. And I wonder if you might comment, one, on the nurses, and two, on those that might have disagreed and what would have happened to them. Yeah, the nurses obviously were very important, but they were relatively powerless because the German society and German medicine in particular was very hierarchical. And uh, German medical physicians here, professor, uh, doctor, were very powerful. So it was difficult to disobey their orders. But nurses did. They were, uh, there was very little resistance to this program. But nurses were among those who resisted because they actually had to carry out a lot of these orders, administer the poisons and all the rest. So there was some resistance, but by and large, there was not a lot of resistance in the entire medical profession, not among nurses, not among doctors. And those few who did resist were not necessarily punished. There was no need to punishment. If you didn't want to go to work in a euthanasia center, you didn't have to. There were other people waiting to get that job. So there wasn't much resistance. There was resistance among Jewish physicians who were in the camps and elsewhere. But among German physicians, it was minimal resistance, and the same applied to nurses, although many nurses were heroic, not many. Some nurses were heroic in attempting to resist the entire Nazi program. Hi. Is this on? Hi, over here. This is Leah B. Um, I'm a medical student at Georgetown. Um, thank you for your, your talk this morning. One question I had is how to bring this information to medical students and the public. I know. At Georgetown, we're fortunate enough to have such a great bioethics uh, curriculum in our medical school curriculum, but going forward in the profession, what tips do you have for current medical students in as they go through their career, and then also talking about this topic with people outside of the medical profession? Well, I think it's important, obviously, that medical students are made aware of this, particularly early on in their career where they're forming their medical identity. I teach uh, freshmen medical students is material, and I try to get at them before the bioethicists get at them, because I want them to have a different view of what bioethics is all about, because they're going to learn different things from the bioethicists about autonomy and all the rest, and this history is not really taught. So I think it's important that the medical students have it. One of the goals of our Center for Medicine after the Holocaust is to actually have an elective like that, uh, like the, on this material, in every medical school. There are a variety of groups that offer trips to the European medical sites relevant to medicine in the Holocaust. And uh, of course, we hope to have a chair for medicine in the Holocaust here at Georgetown as an example for other academic study, academic institutions to follow. You may not know this since Holocaust studies are universal now in most universities, but at one time they didn't exist. And everything depended upon a man named Michael Berenbaum who wanted to create such a study, which he did, and now there are all over universities in America, and we're hoping that if Georgetown can establish this chair, that other academic institutions will follow. So their medical students will learn this history, go to Germany, go to Europe, go to uh, uh, Poland, and see this stuff. Because I think it's, it, you will be a different physician if you understand the moral hazards that are inherent to the practice of medicine. You need to learn those. So. My tip for you is go find a way to take a trip like that. It'll change you as a person for the better and make you a much better doctor. So the, the, the public health service study of syphilis hits the newspapers in 1972. And um, this uh, provides a lot of the impetus for a series of hearings that uh, Ted Kennedy had, um, uh, which led to the passage of a law, right? Um, but a lot of the hearings that Kennedy did were devoted to things like sterilization um, and eugenics issues, etc. But the result in terms of the direction that the government was given through the law 
was almost exclusively on uh, research rather than the practice of medicine, right? The, the government was directed to pass regulations about research. The Belmont Report, which is considered sort of the American Bible for, for research ethics, distinguishes between the practice of medicine and, and research and talks about the ethical principles um, that should be used in the practice of research. So the government sort of left out, the result was that the government left out uh, any real uh, policy position with regard to the practice of medicine. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on- Yes, I mean, it's on, a very, on, very important that point. That result was. When the, when the uh, Tuskegee study reared its head and the government responded, they only focused on one of the three areas of medicine. They focused on human subject research. They did not deal with clinical medicine. They did not deal with public health. The same thing actually happened at the Nuremberg Medical Trial. The focus was on research, not on clinical medicine, euthanasia, public health, certainly. And it needed to be. And in fact, that void was filled by the culture and politics, because medicine failed to deal with all of this in an adequate fashion and address concerns about the medical ethics of clinical medicine and public health. The focus was entirely on human subject research, which is much easier to deal with. Autonomy works very well when you ask someone to volunteer for a human subject research experiment. In, in clinical medicine, people aren't volunteering, and the relationship is much more complicated, very difficult to define, very difficult to regulate. Same thing goes for public health, as you saw during this uh, pandemic. So your point is very well taken, and we're still struggling with that aspect of clinical medicine and public health medicine, whereas I think we've been very successful in protecting patients in human re subject research. It's a very good question. Hi, hey, Dr. Rubin. Dr. Rubenfeld, um, I know that we're, we're running short on time. We have one last question. I'm taking the uh, privilege as a mic holder to ask, could you just clarify a little bit more about the diversity, equity, and inclusion comments that you made earlier? I think that really a focus on diversity and equity and inclusion would have been a, a good thing to prevent some of the, the, the to prevent the Holocaust. So um, if you could just clarify what well, you were I think the arguing. diversity, equity, and inclusion piece comes out of critical race theory and a focus on, quote, systemic racism in medicine. And when you focus on races, you're asking for trouble, in my view. It comes out as diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it starts with a focus on the person as a member of a race. And that's very problematic. Had the Germans not focused on members of a race, but treated them as individuals, they could not possibly have gone down the path they went, in my view. So I think it's dangerous to focus on population ethics, starting with the concept of systemic racism in medicine. I think it's just dangerous. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are very nice terms, but the underlying principle is that there is systemic racism in medicine, which I don't think there actually is. There certainly is racism, but I don't, I'm not even sure what systemic racism means. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attention. Again, I'm happy to introduce, <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Holland Manning Kaplan, a clinical ethics fellow from the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Kaplan. Thank you very much. Very excited to be here. Uh, very honored to be invited to speak. Um, I'm going to talk about a topic today that I've been interested in for almost 10 years now. Um, when I first started medical school, and I actually took Dr. Rubenfeld's elective um, and learned more about this topic. A couple of years after that, I went on a trip to Auschwitz uh, through the fellowships at Auschwitz for the study of professional ethics and had the opportunity to actually uh, see the places where these things happened. And I think that um, those experiences, my experiences now as a, a junior faculty member practicing medicine, teaching medicine uh, to residents and students, um, have given me a unique perspective in thinking about these issues, specifically doctors in the camps, 
what they did, how they got there, and how we can learn from this for the future. I'm going to go through a, uh, a timeline to try and describe some of the answers to these questions. I'm going to start actually with the end point, which is answering the question um, that's been addressed to some extent already of what the Nazi doctors actually did in the camps. What are the orders that they gave? What are the things that they said? What are some of the uh, actual statements that Nazi doctors who were interviewed after the fact said about those experiences? Then I'm going to rewind a little bit and talk about how young physicians in particular ended up working in death camps. What was the educational background? What was the uh, political uh, milieu that they were experiencing that led them, um, people who were my age, to actually commit these atrocities in death camps? Then I'm gonna fast forward to the present and talk about some of the vulnerabilities that I think were present in, uh, in the Nazi physicians, young Nazi physicians in particular, and some of those vulnerabilities that persist uh, in, in medicine, in medical training today. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future. Uh, this is something that's been addressed a little bit already in this symposium, but how can the lessons that we have learned from the Nazi doctors, how can this be applied to medical education? Uh, what, how can we enact this imperative to include this curriculum uh, in, our, uh, in our medical schools, in our medical training? I'm gonna start again with what the Nazi doctors actually did in the camps. I'm gonna focus specifically on doctors at Auschwitz um, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is that this is the camp that I, I had the opportunity to visit, um, and the pictures that I'm going to show are pictures that, uh, that I actually took. Um, I'm gonna go through the progression of, from the perspective of an inmate at Auschwitz, what they would have seen, and then I'm gonna go through exactly what the Nazi doctors were doing at each part of this process. So inmates would first arrive at the camp via train after they had been um, uh, put on the train from wherever they were coming from. Uh, this would include Jews, it would include uh, gypsies, Poles, other political prisoners. And after several days on the train, they would find themselves at the camp, in this case at Auschwitz. They would be escorted off of the uh, train and they would end up on a ramp, on the ramp where the selections took place, uh, the notorious selections. And you can see in this picture, um, there's a man on the right who is pointing uh, to the right to, the, to indicate that this elder, elderly gentleman should uh, be going to the gas chambers. And that, that man is a physician. From the selections on the ramp, inmates were selected either to go to slave labor within the camps or to the gas chamber directly. Um, there were camps that focused more on uh, slave labor, fo focused more on um, killing, and Auschwitz was one of the camps that focused on both. Those who were selected to go to slave labor ultimately oftentimes would end up in the gas chambers for a variety of reasons. And those who went to the gas chamber uh, were then uh, brought to the crematoria, uh, oftentimes by Jewish prisoners known as Sonderkommando. From, from the uh, inmates who were uh, involved in slave labor and labor in the camps, some of them ended up, as we've discussed in several other lectures, uh, undergoing medical experimentation, which I'll talk about a little bit. Some of these inmates ended up in the medical block, um, which was, uh, this was meant to be a guise that, uh, that, that the camp was providing medical care to its inmates, where, in fact, a lot of the people who ended up here were killed uh, in various ways. The inmates who were used for medical experimentation, who ended up in the medical block, a lot of them as well, ended up in the gas chamber, ended up in the crematoria. So first I'm gonna address the role that the Nazi doctors had um, in the selections and in that selection process specifically to slave labor. So I think one question that is important and, and important to ask is why doctors? Why was it that doctors had to be the ones who were making these selections? And as has been alluded to in prior talks, this entire endeavor, Auschwitz, the Holocaust, was seen by the Germans to be a public health endeavor. Um, this was something that should be in the hands of physicians because it was a measure of public health. The idea was to eliminate um, what was thought to be um, a weak part of the German population and strengthen the entire population, the German Volk. 
On the ramps, um, they actually had schedules um, that would be submitted weeks in advance. All of the physicians had to do time um, uh, on the ramps, and it was actually considered to be uh, a dreaded job, not necessarily because of the work itself, but partially because it was just considered to be laborious. You were having to stand there for long periods of time. Um, there was understandably resistance that was taking place when the selections were being made. And a lot of these physicians uh, coped with um, heavy drinking in order to get through these shifts. The, the physicians, the Nazi doctors, are the ones who devise the formula of selection for arriving prisoners. They are the ones who, of course, actually decided who was going to go in which direction. So they typically decided to send uh, older, uh, more debilitated people um, to the gas chambers while, while uh, sending the younger, more fit people to the, to the labor camps. Um, Another decision that was made by the doctors, for example, was when there were women and children who were being selected, the decision was made um, whether or not to separate the women and children, given that some of the women would have been young enough to be able to, um, to work in the camps. And the decision a lot of the time was um, to not separate them because that caused um, a lot of uh, distress, as, as you can imagine, and to just direct uh, both of them to the gas chambers to avoid, to avoid that scene. Doctors also had a role in, uh, in thinning the ranks of the camp itself. So selections didn't just take place on the ramps, they took place in the camps as well. And in the camps, um, they would, one example of how this took place is they would line up uh, inmates and they would have them uh, strip off all their clothes and uh, Nazi doctors would look who had, um, who had boils, who had scars, who were wearing bandages, and they would send uh, those people to the gas chambers. And again, the idea here was that they wanted to maintain a workforce. Um, the Germans did use the camps as a uh, considerable, for, uh, considerable source of labor, and they also wanted to balance the number of people in the camps that could perform the labor that was needed um, with uh, an, uh, keeping an appropriate number that uh, epidemics like typhus, scarlet fever would not spread throughout the camp. Um, and that was a discussion that happened at higher levels um, in the Nazi, uh, in the, in the Nazi leadership as well to try and maintain that balance. So you can see here at the bottom um, this quote from uh, Ernst B, who is a Nazi physician uh, who was interviewed by Robert Lifton, and this is from his, uh, his book, The Nazi Doctors, which um, really characterizes how uh, detailed the doctors were in thinking about these issues. And this was from an interview that was done decades after this, uh, this physician was in the camps. So he said, there were numerous discussions. Should one gas more? Should one gas fewer? Where's the limit to be set? That is, if you take more old people into camps, there are more diseased people, and that, for many reasons, is the worst problem. Next, I'm going to talk about the doctor's roles in the gas chambers and the crematoria. After the selection process, the Nazi doctors would ride to the, uh, to the gas chambers in a vehicle that was marked with a red cross. And the purpose of this was to maintain the illusion um, up until the very end that, the, that doctors were functioning in a healing capacity, that they were helping the inmates. And this led to, um, for example, uh, inmates who were on the ramps to actually um, request to or chase after these vans because they wanted to go in that direction. They thought that people who were going in that direction would get better care. Um, and what would happen after they reached the gas chamber is uh, the physicians would escort all of the inmates into the gas chamber and they would, um, they would close the door, and the physicians are the ones who decided, based on how many inmates were in the gas chamber, how many pellets they were going to throw in, how many pellets of gas. Um, they watched through a peephole um, as the inmates um, died, and that usually happened over the span of, depending on what you read, anywhere from four to eight minutes uh, up to 15 minutes. And after that took place, the doctors, the Nazi doctors would go in wearing a gas mask and they would uh, pronounce everybody dead. They also um, provided technical knowledge on how to burn large numbers of bodies. And this was a problem and a challenge in the camps that um, apparently required a lot of thought from physicians, from physicists, from chemists. This was a, a very... Um, challenging issue for them to deal with. And you can see again uh, from this Nazi physician, Ernst B, a quote, 
One had to burn great piles, enormous piles. Now that is a great problem, igniting piles of corpses. You can imagine, naked, nothing burns. How does one manage this? And Lifton in his book notes that when he had this discussion um, with this Nazi physician, that he could, he could kind of see the, the excitement uh, kind of building in his, even as you know, decades later talking about this topic, it still seemed like an, an interesting problem that he had grappled with and that he had needed to solve. Next, I'll talk about the medical blocks at Auschwitz. Inmates who were sent to the medical blocks often were quite sick. Um, they may have had infectious diseases. And when they were sent to the medical blocks, like I mentioned, oftentimes the goal was not necessarily to, uh, to treat them. It was more to determine if they could be treated to the point that they could return to, uh, to perform the needed labor. If it was determined that within about two or three weeks they would not be able to recover, they were uh, killed either by means of direct phenol injections or sent to the, uh, sent to the gas chambers um, to be gassed. Um, and it was physicians who were the ones who were either supervising or, or um, engaging in these direct injections to kill these patients. Physicians also engaged in signing fake death certificates. So after, uh, after these patients, these inmates died, uh, the physicians would um, sign the death certificate and come up with some etiology of death. Uh, they would cardiac, respiratory, they would come up with something to include. The physicians also signed forms that attested to the physical capacity of inmates to absorb corporal punishment. They would also be present while the corporal punishment took place to ensure that the prisoner was able to withstand it. Again, with the idea being that they did want to maintain this labor force And next, I'll touch uh, a little bit on the medical experimentation. I don't want to go into this too much since it'll be addressed in other parts of the symposium. But the three general categories of medical experimentation that took place um, and at Auschwitz in the notorious Block 10 um, were, first of all, experiments that supported the Germans' goals surrounding uh, eugenics and racial hygiene, so sterilization experiments. Um, experiments that had to do with um, things that could so somehow help or improve the German military. Uh, so injecting uh, people with blood from patients with typhus in order to attempt to find uh, cures uh, and treatments for typhus. And the uh, notorious cold immersion studies um, to determine how uh, German pilots who had fallen into the water could, could potentially be, um, be saved. And then the last category is research projects that individual physicians just had a personal interest in. Um, and this uh, could come in many forms. Um, as, as we've discussed, uh, Dr. Mengele is one of the uh, most notorious um, examples of this. And he would actually go along the lines uh, of people in the selections and call out for twins to do his experiments on. There was also the collection of uh, specimens uh, for museums, so uh, the skulls of victims, for example, that were um, displayed in Berlin. Um, and then there, were, there was also opportunities, uh, quote, opportunities for medical students to practice surgeries on living or recently deceased um, camp uh, uh, victims. So this is, this is just kind of overall a summary uh, from, from the victim's perspective of what the doctors actually did at Auschwitz, how they participated in this endeavor, how they gave the orders, how they injected the medications, how they observed and enabled the process of killing people in the gas chambers. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about the social, political, educational um, landscape that enabled young physicians who may have been in medical school at this time um, to end up working in death camps. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the same, uh, same young physician that uh, Dr. Rubenfeld talked about, uh, Dr. Ermfried Burl, um, who was born in 1910, uh, died in 1948. Uh, he hung himself prior to the Nuremberg trials. But this man, um, when, he, when he became the commandant of Treblinka, um, one of the notorious death camps, he was my age. He was very young. And he started off when he was in his early 20s. When he was in medical school, he joined the Nazi party. Several years later, when Hitler took power, he was completing his training in psychiatry. Several years after that, he was uh, made the head of the uh, Brandenburg and Bernburg uh, euthanasia facilities 
where one of his roles was to ensure that the causes of death that were listed, that were falsely listed across different euthanasia centers were believable. And an example of this is that one euthanasia killing center um, was apparently listing uh, tuberculosis too frequently. And the concern was that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the measures that would be needed to contain tuberculosis and the duration of illness just wouldn't match up with, um, with what was actually happening. And so he instructed um, the, uh, the leaders of that euthanasia facility um, to uh, kind of balance the, the diagnoses that they were putting more accurately. And he made it very clear that he felt that it was doctors, it was physicians who needed to be the ones who were determining the fake diagnoses um, for these patients. In the year and a half that he was in charge of several euthanasia centers, he facilitated the murder of about uh, close to 20,000 people. When he was appointed the um, commandant of Treblinka, um, he was the only physician who ever served in this role uh, as the, the, the person most in charge of the, uh, of the camp. And he, um, as Dr. Rubenfeld mentioned, about a month into his tenure there, SS officers came to investigate uh, how, how things were going. And when they arrived on the train at Treblinka, there were hundreds, thousands of corpses just strewn about uh, the railway uh, because he was having trouble figuring out a way to dispose of the corpses quickly enough. And so he was released uh, from that position. But in his uh, one month period at Treblinka, he murdered almost 200,000 Jews. To, to discuss medical education in the Nazi era a little bit, um, this book, uh, Medical Jurisprudence and Rules of the Medical Profession uh, by Rudolf Ram, was actually translated into English a couple of years ago, so makes it more accessible to, to people like me who are, who are not fluent in German. Um, but this book is the medical ethics textbook of the Nazi medical students, of the Nazi doctors. This is what they used instead of what I used, which was Beecham and Childress, the classic kind of medical ethics textbook. And reading through this is really interesting because there are definitely echoes of the same themes that are in the textbooks that I used to learn medical ethics. Um, for example, they talk about confidentiality, they talk about duty to warn, right to privacy, um, the importance of um, focusing on the patient. And of course, the, the difference is that they embrace um, the uh, philosophies of racial hygiene and eugenics. And it's interesting because those philosophies are, in part of this book, they indicate what the curriculum is for medical students and what, uh, what medical students need to do in order to, to complete their training. And in the same way that in, in medical school I had anatomy courses, physiology courses, um, they had uh, courses on eugenics. They took exams in eugenics, in racial hygiene. That was just a part of their curriculum. Further evidence of uh, how ingrained the eugenic and racial hygiene philosophies were in med medical education uh, can be found in uh, doctoral theses of German medical students that were uh, translated recently into English. And there are a couple of general themes in some of these theses, um, again, that I think reveal what the focus was of, of these medical students. One general topic was uh, a discussion of the uh, sterilization of women and girls who were, quote, feeble-minded. And in those theses, it act they actually acknowledge that this term, feeble-mindedness, is a very nebulous term that uh, is really cannot be defined. And so that's something that's acknowledged. Uh, some of the other uh, doctoral theses discussed different surgical techniques that were used for sterilization. And there were many, many different techniques that were used. Um, one of them is indicated here where a hemostat is used to um, crush a segment of the fallopian tube, which then scars down and renders the patient um, infertile. And w one of the uh, parts of one of these uh, theses, as you can see that I'll read in a second down here, uh, demonstrates an attempt at reconciling the uh, sterilization attempts with what medical students were, were taught as the Hippocratic Oath. So here, one of the, uh, one of the theses said, um, the best method of surgery must be chosen, which gives the patient the best chances of a quick release, accommodating the safety of the patient with regards to life, complications, and success of the operation. So you can see the tension there, the balancing of those, uh, those two concepts. 
Next, I'll talk about the uh, leadership school for Nazis at uh, Alt Reza. Um, this was a, a school that was located outside of Berlin, um, at, next to apparently a very picturesque lake, um, that was considered to be an indoctrination school for Nazi doctors. Uh, it was led by Nazis, and uh, d doctors would attend a two-week course in um, public health, racial hygiene, n general Nazi ideology, and they would um, come out kind of being, hopefully, um, the ideal Nazi doctors. This school actually specifically targeted young Nazi physicians, young physicians who would then become Nazi physicians, with the idea that they were potentially particularly susceptible to this ideology and that they might be the future leaders of the Nazi party. One description of this leadership school that you can see here um, says, fulfilling these new duties presupposes each individual physician must change his attitude and that the entire medical community must undertake a moral and intellectual renewal. So these new duties indicating the duty of the physician as being the physician of the German race, the German Volk, as opposed to the individual patient. And the moral intellectual renewal uh, representing uh, eugenic philosophy and racial hygiene. The last component of, I think, the educational landscape that, uh, that medical students um, and young physicians found them in was uh, it just clearly in the scientific literature. Um, I, think, I think this is important because medical trainees um, find themselves um, learning medicine from, from the scientific literature. Um, I myself receive in my inbox um, every other week a New England Journal of Medicine journal watch where I kind of see all of the different articles that uh, have recently been published, and that's something that I read and learn from. And uh, similarly, if, if email had existed back then, then, uh, then medical students, uh, young physicians, would have received these kinds of things in their inbox. Um, in 1925, the Annals of Eugenics journal was founded, and that journal actually ultimately became a journal that still exists today called the Annals of Human Genetics. In uh, Nature, in 1904, they uh, published a uh, speech by uh, Francis Galton on eugenics. Science, in 1921, published the proceedings of uh, one of the big eugenics meetings on the first page um, of their journal. And then here in 1929, um, you can see uh, a uh, correspondence uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine regarding eugen eugenics and the feeble-minded. Now I'm going to move to talking about uh, some of the similar challenges, some of the vulnerabilities that we see in modern day medicine uh, and medical education uh, that might be similar to some of the vulnerabilities faced by the uh, Nazi physicians, by medical students at that time. Before I talk about this, um, I want to give two caveats. The first is that I think that it can be dangerous, it can be harmful to make direct comparisons between the present and Nazi Germany. And I don't want to imply that there are direct similarities. Um, all that I want to do is demonstrate that there are some uh, similar vulnerabilities, some themes that we may be able to learn from. The second caveat is that some of these uh, vulnerabilities, as anyone in the audience who's a physician can attest to, are adaptive, and they are things that, um, particularly the hierarchy in medicine, balancing empathy and detachment, these are things that um, can be helpful to the profession of, uh, of, of medicine and in, in our day-to-day -day medical practice. So for each of these vulnerabilities, I'm going to talk about um, how this applied in the uh, Nazi period, and then I'm going to talk about uh, some potentially similar um, features uh, of, that are present in today's uh, practice of medicine, medical education. I'll start with the value of conformity, obedience, and hierarchy. Um, in Nazi Germany, there was, um, of course, a robust medical hierarchy, um, even more ro significantly more robust than I think is present today. Um, and this was compounded by the fact that uh, in Nazi Germany, when physicians were involved in a lot of these uh, atrocities, they were being called up for military duty. So they had uh, dual loyalties to the hierarchy of medicine and the hierarchy of the military. In the present time, um, there is, of course, still a continuation of the hierarchy in medical training. Traditionally, medical students answer to interns and residents, interns and residents answer to attendings, um, and that hierarchy um, 
has a rationale for it, um, but it also has, um, it can have concerning features. For example, um, medical students or residents might feel uncomfortable asking questions um, or bringing up concerns to those higher on the hierarchy um, of them due to um, worries that they may have uh, negative repercussions, such as a negative evaluation that might make it challenging for them to get into the specialty that they want to. Um, there's also, like I just mentioned, concerns for retaliation with questioning authority. That definitely still exists. Um, and I, I still remember from my experience in residency, there were times when, as a senior resident, I didn't always agree with the plan um, that my attending had. Um, but because I was the resident, they were the attending, we had to go, well, we had to go with the attending's plan. And um, that, I'm gonna touch on the Milgram experiments a little bit. So these, these are the experiments in the 1960s that were done in response to the Nuremberg trials where doctors claimed that they were just following orders. And these experiments demonstrated that people have a, a chilling willingness to follow orders, especially when there is the perception that the responsibility of the consequences of those orders will be displaced to somebody else. So when I was a resident and I had to do what an attending felt was the, was the best plan for a patient, in my mind I was thinking, well, I'm not the one who's gonna ultimately be responsible for this. Like, I don't necessarily agree, but I'm not the one who's ultimately responsible. And so I can understand where this was coming from. Next, uh, talking about economic insecurity. Uh, so we touched already a little bit on how in Nazi Germany, um, especially, well, before Nazi Germany and the post-World War I depression, um, nobody was well off financially, physicians included. Um, after World War I, Germany was in a horrible depression. Um, the German mark was essentially worthless. You can see in this picture here some kids making a kite out of uh, German marks because there was, that was a more helpful way to use the currency than to actually buy things. In the present time, um, there is increasing medical student debt. Uh, medical students will often graduate with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, uh, and that may include debt from undergraduate education as well. Uh, there's also an insufficient number of residency positions. So there can be concern after graduating from medical school that um, new doctors won't be able to find further training, that they won't actually have a job. Next. I'll discuss susceptibility to ambition um, and opportunities for professional advancement. So in Nazi Germany, um, there were young physicians, as we discussed, who were recruited to work in euthanasia centers. And this was an opportunity right out of medical school, right after their medical training, that was um, quite an opportunity for advancement that might not have otherwise been available. Human subject research, um, again, for which the example, the classic example is uh, Joseph Mengele, was another opportunity for advancement where someone as young as Mengele, who was in his 30s when he did this research, had the um, opportunity to do research on twins specifically that he was interested in that he wouldn't have been able to do in any other setting. And he was able to uh, publish this research and um, advance academically because of those opportunities. Today, um, there is still a lot of um, susceptibility to um, wanting to advance. Medical students tend to, of course, be very ambitious. Um, the pre-medical and medical school curricula are very rigorous, um, and I think they have to be. But the result of that can be um, competing with one another uh, to the point that there's a, there's a term in uh, medical school for medical students who are trying to um, outcompete uh, other medical students and it's called gunning. And people who do that are called gunners where they quote gun down other students in order to get where they want to go. Um, and I think it's, it's not an uncommon sentiment that in order to get into more competitive specialties um, like dermatology, like some of the uh, surgical subspecialties, it's necessary to, um, to push others down to get yourself ahead. That is not an uncommon sentiment in modern day medical training. It can also be uh, difficult to reach the end of a prescribed path. And what I mean by this is after someone has gone through four years of college, four years of medical school, uh, anywhere from three to, uh, three to eight or more uh, years of uh, residency and fellowship, um, in medicine we're very used to going along a prescribed path. And once you reach the end of that path, you're not really sure what to do. Um, it's not entirely clear what the next step is. 
Um, and so if at the end of that path, you're, op you're offered a professional opportunity um, that is clearly a great opportunity, um, that's something that you will be very tempted to take because it will represent the next step in this uh, logical sequence of medical education. Balancing empathy and detachment. Uh, this is, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, I think it's pretty evident how this took place. Um, in, in the uh, ethics textbook that I, uh, that I showed before, um, empathy actually is, is mentioned as a, a role, uh, an important value of physicians, of prioritizing the patient over the self as a physician. Um, detachment, of course, took place uh, commonly um, by, uh, for physicians who were in the camps. Specifically, um, Lifton uh, mentioned, mentions in his book this concept of doubling where doctors who were in Auschwitz, for example, had an Auschwitz self and they had a non-Auschwitz self, and that's how they, uh, they coped with some of the atrocities that they were committing. I mentioned already the heavy alcohol use that some of the Nazi doctors um, engaged in to cope with some of the things that they were doing. And then there was this revulsion towards firing squads, which was one of the initial mechanisms that was used um, to kill undesirable populations, just using firing squads before gassing was more prevalent. And that was, um, that was considered undesirable by both the people who were in the firing squads, but also by doctors, because you were standing there looking eye to eye at the person that you were killing. And gas chambers provided an opportunity to both physically and emotionally distance yourself from the people that you were killing. Nowadays, this is still a challenge in medicine. It's a challenge that I grapple with every single day. Um, and as early as the first week of medical school, this comes up when you are um, put into an anatomy, an, an anatomy lab and told to cut into a cadaver, to cut into a dead person. And you have to balance your um, ability to cut open this person, um, learn from them, and then after that, you know, go get lunch with your friends and then go do, take another course on how to get a history. Uh, I still particularly remember one anatomy session um, on the anatomy of the spinal cord where we were actually instructed to use um, chainsaws to cut through the vertebrae on the back in order to access the spinal cord and uh, dissect apart the nerves. And so you can see how that would be very um, disturbing and for the, for the sake of learning, that's something that was necessary to do, but um, it, it, it is, uh, it's a bit uncomfortable to, to do that. Um, additionally, there have been studies that have been done that demonstrate that medical students, over the course of their medical training, even just throughout the four years of medical school, demonstrate uh, decreasing empathy over time. And I think in some ways this is an adaptive mechanism. Um, the, the example that I, that I give is that if, I, if I'm in the hospital taking care of a patient, um, if I have a patient who's not doing well, um, or if I have to um, run a code, do CPR on a patient um, for maybe 20 minutes, and then talk to the family about what happened with their loved one, and then after that I might have to run to another room and go treat a pneumonia in another room, um, and then I might have to go to another room and um, do something else that just, going between different rooms, having to quickly change your mindset to treat patients and um, do this job is challenging. And if I were to completely engage myself in uh, emotionally in the work that I did, I would not sleep at night. And there were many nights in residency where I did not sleep because of that reason. Finally, this temptation of being drawn away from the patient as a focus. Um, in Nazi Germany, we talked about this um, already, um, the, the ideology of focusing on the German Volk rather than individuals. So um, the, the physicians were pulled away from thinking about individual patients and instead thinking of the entire German population as their patients. There are so many different things nowadays that pull our attention away from the patient. The first thing I'll talk about briefly is the electronic medical records. Um, I think any physician will attest to the fact that electronic medical records, while certainly having some positive features, pull our attention away from patients. Um, there was a study in JAMA several years ago that demonstrated that um, first year medical interns spend anywhere from 70 to 90% of their time engaged in non-patient care activities. So in a 12 to 16 hour day, they are spending maybe 10% of their time actually at the bedside interacting with patients. 
There are also um, nowadays financial undertones that uh, creep into a lot of different aspects of, um, of, our, of our practice. Um, we are told how many RVUs we've generated. We are told how many RVUs we need to generate, how many patients we need to be taking care of. Um, there are other motivations for procedural specialties to do procedures um, other than just indications from the patient. And then finally, there's this focus on throughput and efficiency. And I think this is manifested particularly um, in, in an experience that I've had where hospitals have started implementing this uh, policy where patients need to be discharged by 11 a.m. And the theory is that this will Im improve throughput through the hospital. And I think when, when you have uh, rules like that, it can pull, again, it can pull the focus away from the patient, and uh, sometimes it will, it will cause you to discharge patients uh, unsafely because you're trying to meet these metrics that the hospital is really pressuring you to meet. All right, so then to finish off, I'm gonna talk about how these lessons uh, learned from Nazi doctors' actions can be applied in medical education, in medical training, um, just some proposed ideas. I think the important thing here is to focus on maintaining professionalism. And like Dr. Rubenfeld mentioned, we're in a profession, what are we professing? Um, and I think there's, I divided this up into thinking about before training, during medical school residency and fellowship, and after training, some suggestions for things that can be done um, to, to maintain professionalism. Before training, um, this was briefly discussed yesterday, um, in the process of selecting medical students, I think it's important to emphasize character in addition to academic prowess. And part of the reason for that is that once a student is in medical school, they are very likely to graduate. Very few people fail out of medical school. So once they are selected to uh, enter medical school, they will likely become a physician. And a couple of ways that this can be done is uh, adjusting pre-med course requirements. So ensuring that um, there are not so many uh, requirements to take biochemistry and higher level science courses that there's no possibility of taking humanities courses. Standardized exams, uh, so the MCAT, for example, the uh, entrance uh, admissions exam for medical school. Um, when I took this exam, it did not have any humanities in it. It just had a, um, a critical, uh, critical reading section. Um, it actually has humanities aspects in it now. It's changed quite a bit. Um, the next thing is the, the interview process of getting into medical school. When I did interviews, there was one institution that I interviewed at that implemented this approach called multiple mini interviews, where instead of sitting in one room uh, talking to somebody where both people are kind of saying what they think needs to be said, um, met the, the, the college student, the pre-med student, um, is introduced to different scenarios where they have to respond um, to an ethical dilemma, to uh, some other kind of situation, so that the uh, interviewers can see how they respond to situations instead of just asking them, um, um, well, what questions do you have? Why do you want to be a doctor? And then the other, the other um, aspect of standardized exams that is uh, new in the world of entry to medical school is these exams that, that I learned about that are called, uh, they're called CASPERS. Um, and so what these are is a situational judgment exam where a situation is presented to the student and they have to uh, respond with how they would what they would do in that situation, and more importantly, why they would do what they would do. And many medical schools across the country use this exam now as a part of their admissions process. During medical school residency and fellowship, I think it's important to establish and evaluate professionalism-based learning objectives. This is something that, for example, in 2018, the uh, accrediting body for gradu graduate medical education released new milestones that um, include a milestone of professionalism and ethical principles. And this is something that all residency programs are required to use to assess their residents as they progress uh, through medical training. I think it's important to nurture, recognize, and reward humanism. Uh, the example of one way that this is done is through the Gold Humanism Honor Society, where medical students can be inducted into this society um, at the end of medical school if they've demonstrated humanistic qualities. Promoting professionalism through formal and informal, or the hidden curriculum, uh, I think is also, uh, also important. Um, including implicit bias and diversity, equity, and inclusion training. I think that this is an important way to um, 
introduce students to um, the diversity of patients that they'll be taking care of. Um, in addition to, um, at, at, at when I was in medical school, um, we, we talked about social determinants of health. So things other than um, uh, medical uh, features that affect, affect a person's health. And then, of course, incorporating relative human, uh, relevant humanities into, into the curriculum. And this is where I think um, Holocaust education, medicine after the Holocaust, is absolutely essential. After training, I think that uh, institutional and organizational support can be provided to young faculty um, in the form of both formal and informal mentorship. I think the time right after training as a young faculty member is a very vulnerable one where you're, you're still creating your identity as a physician. It's important to acknowledge that and provide support um, to people who are uh, undergoing that, uh, that experience. Then enabling claiming uh, continuing medical education or CME credits on topics in humanities and medicine uh, is also important. And this is done already, but I think that it, uh, that it could be done more. And then I'm going to finish up with a couple of specific cases that demonstrate um, how these concepts that I started learning about um, almost 10 years ago in Dr. Rubenfeld's elective course, how they still impact me on a day-to-day -day basis. So I work at a hospital, uh, Ben Tobb General Hospital in Houston, where we take care primarily of patients who are um, uninsured, who might be undocumented, homeless, incarcerated, have nowhere else to go um, to get their health care. Patients that the Nazis would have considered life unworthy of life. And I think it's important um, in every day of my practice and in, in my teaching to ensure that uh, these patients are getting access to the highest quality health care, the same quality of health care that the patients across the street at the private institutions are getting. On an almost monthly basis, I receive requests from patients for um, euthanasia. And these are usually end-stage cancer patients. And the way that it's requested, it's not always immediately apparent that that's what they're asking for. But uh, just last month, I had a patient who asked me to give him some extra morphine when he went home with end-stage cancer so that when things got really bad that he could uh, end his life earlier. And uh, medical aid in dying is not legal in Texas, and so that's not something that, that would have been available regardless. But it just reminds me um, and forces me to think about what is the line between a physician's role in healing and in helping people have um, a comfortable death. And then finally, um, I also work uh, as an ethics consultant, and uh, I think it's easy to see why this consult sort of um, triggered some, some, some comparisons to this, um, this area. Um, I received a consult on whether it was appropriate to uh, sterilize an intellectually disabled woman who had a high-risk pregnancy and who, if she were to have another pregnancy, was at high risk of death, who was not able to consent to this procedure because of her intellectual disability. Overall, I think it's very easy, it's very tempting to think that the Nazi doctors did not have any ethical principles, that they were sadistic monsters who were an aberration in history. Um, that will never happen again. Unfortunately, that's just not true. Um, we've seen um, how, these, um, how these young doctors came to be the people they were, the people who were in the camps giving the orders, um, directly killing people. And I think that the best thing that we can do in the medical profession is to continue to educate medical students, residents, about these atrocities so that they can recognize that even small transgressions in professionalism can have profound effects uh, down the line in their clinical practice. And this is a quote um, that uh, I read in a, in a paper um, by uh, Matt Winia. As a, light, as a lighthouse can mark a reef, medicine can and must use the light from the flames of hell, the lessons learned from the Nazi doctors, as a warning beacon. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for your lectures. Very interesting, uh, I can say, sort of dialogue um, with, with, with the past. Um, it's really a comment. We know Ernst B was an Auschwitz doctor called Hans Munk, and Hans Munk attracted, sp spoke a lot about his time in the camps. We know that he declined 
to act on the ramps, but he was responsible for selections in the blocks where um, prisoners were there. So he there's a good side, and there is an atrocity side. So I think he's a he's a very complex figure. Uh, involved in medical experiments, uh, all sorts of things like that. So one needs to balance the two sides very carefully. Agreed. Thank you for that comment. Wasn't he the doctor? Hello. Wasn't he the doctor, Dr. Monk, um, who uh, Eva Kaur, um met with? Eva. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, Eva Kaur, For those who don't know, was a, uh, a survivor of the Auschwitz uh, twin experiments, and uh, she was 11 when she was liberated in 1945. She died uh, a year or two ago, um, and she, there's a documentary about her uh, where she gave her forgiveness um, at the uh, 50th anniversary of liberation, and she was quite a controversial figure among survivors. But I met her, and I. She spoke at one of Dr. Rubenfeld's conferences, and I was very impressed with her. Um, my question is, um, that school in Germany um, that was indoctrinating the doctors, um, do you know what's become of that institution there? I, the institution does not exist in that form anymore. Um, I do know whenever I was doing research on that institution, Al Teresa, um, whenever I uh, Google it, look online, it's actually advertised as a beautiful place to vacation. Um, so I don't know what's happened to that specific institution, but I do know that that area in general, apparently very beautiful. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention, um, I know that um, you, you take people to Auschwitz. Do you still do this annually? Not annually. Sometimes, okay. There's also an annual trip um, that I took in 2013 um, called the Zen Peacemakers Pilgrimage to Auschwitz, which I highly recommend for anybody who wants to um, really be exposed to the totality of that place, that experience, and also to realize that, as you said, uh, we have within each of us the capacity to become acting in those ways. And um, we... It's easy for us from an armchair point of view to sit there and say, well, if I were in that position, I would never have done anything like that. Can't agree more with the idea of visiting these sites. Um, being there in person is very different from reading about them. Dr. Kaplan, I'm over here against the wall on your left. Adi Haramati, I'm an educator and a scientist here at Georgetown. I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, but I very much appreciated the way you framed uh, your presentation, which is to take um, a view of the Nazi doctors and look at our current medical students and begin to draw parallels, because that's part of the essence of this symposium, is to really glean le lessons. And so I want to make a comment that ties to what Leah asked you earlier about the lessons for medical students. Uh, one of the points you made is the erosion of empathy. And the second point you made is about the, um, your, your encouraging an increased use of, of humanities in the curriculum. I teach science, but I have to tell you that I think one of our key roles as educators is to help train physicians emotionally and non-cognitively in their development, as well as <coughs> cognitively. It's not just about the knowledge and the skills. It's really about their development. And that has to be pr prior a priori into the curriculum as part of what we do in everything that we engage in. And so I think one way that we can do that, and I'm speaking to the audience as well, is to find ways to foster self-awareness, to find ways in which we have students reflect on their experiences. And the one you talked about, the anatomy lab, is a perfect example. We can't just do these things and just let it hang, but we have to bring the students together and have them reflect on what was that experience like and validate the tension that they're feeling, but also where they're moving forward. This is part of that process of educating. Uh, we try to do it with self-awareness. We certainly do it with our ethics. Uh, the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, has an initiative underway that launched last year on the inclusion of arts and humanities in the training. And so I think that this, this material that we're talking about is a perfect example of how we use this to continue to reflect 
and model. And I appreciate the fact that we have students and faculty in the audience to think about that. But thank you for presenting it. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I, I agree that um, uh, reflection is a really critical part of medical education that we don't use enough. Um, after my first year in the anatomy lab, they implemented a, a reflection session after anatomy uh, labs for that very reason. Um, and I've tried to implement uh, reflection sessions, for example, after uh, difficult codes. I think it's very, very important. I'm really so impressed by the presentation you did here, the quality and the level. My question to you is, what was the mental health implication on the Nazi doctors doing what they did? I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, I think there were, there were Nazi doctors who, um, few of them were sadists and who enjoyed what they were doing. Um, I think many of them had to cope with what they were doing by drinking heavily. Um, I think the fact that um, several Nazi doctors um, uh, hanged themselves before the Nuremberg trials indicates to some extent um, how, they, how they felt about their actions. Um, I think it's a, it's a challenging question that I'm sure other people in the audience are more qualified to answer than I am. Hello, Dr. Kaplan, thank you for your presentation. Um, this is Zane Jarakidas, uh, former GEMS and uh, medical school graduate. Um, I wanted to ask the question about what comparisons can be made between uh, the training of physicians in the Reconstruction era and the establishment of Friedman Hospitals um, here in the United States, and what parallels can we draw between the post nuremberg Nuremberg um, period and that period in American history and how is it applicable at this time with our political landscape and social um, temper to address those activities and those uh, atrocities that took place here during that period, a, pre a period that predates uh, the Holocaust. I appreciate the question. Um, I'm not as familiar in depth with that history. Um, I do appreciate the mention, though, of um, even modern day politics as a potential influence on, on the practice of medicine. Um, and I think, I think it's an important question to continue to think about. I unfortunately don't have a detailed answer for the question, um, but, but I think it's an important one. Hi, Jonathan Crane from Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, my question is uh, also about that leadership school, Alta Reza, uh, and School of Medicine education writ large, which seems to uh, take, arrogate to itself the responsibility to align student motivations for engaging in healthcare delivery to certain priorities. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about both the benefits of doing that and also the dangers of trying to align students' motivations and self-perceptions to be all coordinated behind certain narrower sets of priorities rather than the diverse set of priorities that a diverse student body would come into School of Medicine with. I, I think it's very important to, um, and this is this is kind of why I, I do believe that these um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, social determinants of health, um, educational initiatives are very important because I think a lot of medical students um, come from very privileged backgrounds and are not familiar with um, the broad swath of experiences that uh, that 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 people have that are future for medical students that their future patients will have, and so I think. It's important to be exposed to that. Um, I also think that the way that medical ethics is taught now, um, so an emphasis on autonomy, um, really focuses in on the patient and what's important for the patient and prioritizing the patient. And I think that is so important as a general principle um, because it is uh, exactly in counter uh, to what the Nazis did, which was taking the focus away from the individual patient and focusing on German society at large. Um, so I, in my medical training, did not experience any sort of um, indoctrination, for lack of a better word, to one specific um, philosophy or principle um, that, uh, that, that, I can, that I can recall. Uh, 
Thank you very much for your presentation. It was excellent. I'm, I'd like to push you just a little bit without uh, trying to make things too simplistic. Um, I'm from uh, the University of British Columbia, and about a year ago, some issues came up in emergency rooms where um, the indigenous population was being uh, made fun of, ridiculed, uh, coming into emergency. And I guess I could understand what was happening there because I think that um, there is a lot of stress in the emergency room. So can I push you a little bit to comment on um, when you talk about maintaining professionalism uh, beyond, um, how you might think we can improve the systemic issues that are leading to people in such stressful situations doing things that they know are wrong? It's a challenging question. I think I can only speak to the academic setting. Um, and I can say that, uh, for example, at my institution, um, we do have a mechanism in place where um, attending physicians, um, if there is concern about professionalism, um, are, are held accountable for those actions. Um, and students, um, I, I hope, feel comfortable uh, reporting things through anonymous reporting uh, systems um, so that everybody is held accountable by each other. And ultimately, if um, unethical or inappropriate things are taking place, that uh, that's brought forth through this mechanism and that people can be held accountable um, by, I know that the mechanisms that we've used in the past are um, through education, through a change in roles. Um, and ultimately, I think, especially at an academic uh, institution, it's important not only for the sake of that physician and the patients that physician is taking care of, but all of the residents and medical students who are seeing what that physician is doing um, and through the hidden curriculum, uh, learning how to act as a physician because of that. Um, so uh, there are mechanisms in place for addressing that. The efficacy of those, of those uh, mechanisms is another discussion. I want to thank Dr. Kaplan very much. And we're going to take a break now and try and start promptly at 11 o'clock so we can get back on schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you.